Good evening and everybody, everybody, thank you for uh, tuning in to uh, this look at the um, next part of uh, Stephen Drizzen and Richard Leo's um, article discussing the, uh, the, the wrong, wrongful convictions and the um, false confessions in the post DNA era. Um, we stopped at the, st at the part where I was about to look at table one entitled the percentage of false confessions in prior studies of wrongful convictions. And in the um, Badeau and Radlett um, investigation, which is in 1987, the number of false confessions um, in uh, wrongful convictions was 49 out of 350, a percentage of 14%. However, in 1996, in the Connors, Lundgren, Miller and McEwen study, 5 out of 28 uh, gives us a percentage of 18%. Sheck, Barry Sheck, Newfield and Dyer, Dwyer, in 2000, looked at uh, 62 case in, cases in which 15 involved a false confession, giving us a percentage of 24%. And the Innocence Project in 2003, in 35 cases out of 140, the percentage is 25. Um, and I suppose it, uh, you know, Bears, it needs to be pointed out that that rate is is rising. So maybe gradually, maybe uh, consistently. So let's just carry on with the next part. Two, the social psychology of police interrogation and false confession. So apart from the popular and academic literature on miscarriages of justice, there exists a well-established psychological and sociological literature on the causes, characteristics and consequences of police interrogation and false confession. This literature focuses on the techniques and, tra and tra strategies, sorry, I nearly said strategies, strategies of modern police interrogation, which rely on psychological influence, persuasion, deception, and or co coercion to achieve their desired objectives. How these techniques are designed, taught, and practiced in the real world of police questioning. The effects these techniques, these techniques have on the perceptions and behavior of custodial suspects during interrogation, how and why these techniques often lead the guilty to confess truthfully, as well as how and why these same techniques sometimes lead the innocent to confess falsely, the different types of false confession and their characteristics, the psychological traits and characteristics that make some individuals more vulnerable to the pressures of psychological interrogation and the effect of confession evidence on judges and juries in their assessment of the voluntariness and or reliability of a defendant's interrogation induced statements, admissions and or confessions. In earlier eras, the problem of the potential for interrogation induced false confession was more obvious and understandable than it is today. Throughout the 19th century and into the first one third of the 20th century, American police routinely relied on the infliction of bodily pain and psychological torment, the so-called third degree, to extract confessions from custodial suspects. These techniques range from the direct and explicit use of physical violence, such as beating, punching, 
kicking and mauling a suspect to more elaborate strategies of torture such as the sweat box, the water cure and the electric monkey to physically and psychology physiology psych, psychologically coercive techniques that did not leave marks such as the use of a rubber hose suffocation extended incommunicado interrogation or food and sleep deprivation to lesser forms of psychological duress such as threats of harm and promises of leniency as Ernest Jerome Hopkins wrote in the heyday of the third degree there are a thousand forms of compulsion our police show great ingenuity in the ver variety employed the manifold and various techniques of third degree violence were commonplace in an era when American police departments were systematically brutal and corrupt, controlled by political machines rather than an, in, an independent judiciary and had yet to be professionalised. In the wake of the Wickersham, Wickersham Commission report and several US Supreme Court decisions in the 1930s and 40s, American police forces began to reform their interrogation practices, developing psychological techniques and strategies that were believed to be more effective, professional and humane than the third degree. As psychological methods of interrogation have evolved over the years, they have become increasingly sophisticated, relying on more subtle forms of manipulation, deception and coercion. As a result, it is no longer as apparent how or why police interrogation techniques might lead the innocent to falsely confess, particularly to crimes that carry the possibility of lengthy prison sentences or execution. Indeed, in the era of psychological interrogation, the phenomenon of false confession has become counterintuitive because police interrogation is beyond the common knowledge of individuals who have neither experienced it firsthand as a criminal suspect nor performed it as a trained police officer, i.e. the vast majority of the American public. Most people are ignorant of the psychologically manipulative methods and strategies of police interrogators. Most people do not appear to know that interrogation induced false confessions even exist, let alone that police detectives are sent to specialised training schools to learn the techniques of interrogation or how and why they are designed to manipulate the perceptions, reasoning and decision-making of a custodial suspect and thus lead to the decision to confess. Like many criminal justice officials, most people appear to believe in what one of the authors has labelled the myth of psychological interrogation that an innocent person will not falsely confess to a serious crime unless he is physically tortured or mentally ill the myth is of course easily dispelled by the literature on miscarriages of justice as well as the psychological and sociological literature on coercive persuasion and interrogation induced false confession. Social scientists and legal scholars have amply documented that contemporary methods of psychological interrogation can, and sometimes do, lead innocent individuals to confess falsely to a serious felony crime. The social psychological literature 
has thus sought to explain the reasons how and why the strategies of psychological interrogation sometimes lead individuals to confess to crimes they did not commit. Interrogation is different than interviewing. Whereas the goal of interviewing is to obtain the truth through non-accusatorial, open-ended questioning in order to gather general information in the early stages of a criminal investigation. The goal of interrogation is to elicit incriminating statements, admissions and or confessions through the use of psychological methods that are explicitly Explicit, explicitly, pardon, confrontational, manipulative and suggestive. The purpose of interrogation is not to determine whether a suspect is guilty, rather police are trained to interrogate only those suspects whose guilt they presume or believe they have already established. The purpose of interrogation, therefore, is not to investigate or evaluate a suspect's alibi or denials, nor is the purpose of interrogation necessarily to elicit or determine the truth. Rather, the singular purpose of American police interrogation is to elicit incriminating statements and admissions, ideally a full confession, in order to assist the state in its prosecution of the defendant because it is designed to break the anticipated resistance of an individual who is presumed guilty police interrogation interrogation is stress inducing by design it is intentionally structured to promote isolation anxiety fear power powerlessness and hopelessness police interrogation in, involves the use of numerous psychological techniques Prim primary among them isolation accusation attacks on the suspect's alibi and most important in brendan's case cutting off denials confrontation with true or false incriminating ed evidence the use of themes so-called scenarios that recast the suspect's behavior so that he is no longer morally and or legally culpable and inducements. Thus, police interrogation can be described as a two-sided process involving techniques that rely on negative incentives, i.e. tactics that suggest the suspect should confess because no other course of action is plausible, such as confronting suspects with real or invented evidence, identifying contradictions, in the suspect's accounts and refusing to credit his denials or alibi and positive incentives i.e. tactics that suggest the suspect will be in some way will in some way feel better or benefit if he confesses such an appealing such as appealing to the suspect's self-interest or minimizing the seriousness of the offense. Similarly, Sokol psychologist Saul Kassan, who has observed that interrogation techniques involve both, both maximization, scare tactics that are designed to intimidate a suspect by making him believe that the magnitude of the charges and the seriousness of the offense will be exaggerated if he does not confess, and minimization tactics that are designed to lull a suspect into believing that the magnitude of the charges and the seriousness of the offence will be downplayed or lessened if he confesses. I suspect the minimization is the is the main one in Brendan's case. The interrogation training manuals, as well as some empirical scholarship, provide a laundry list of contemporary police interrogation techniques in order to fully understand the psychology of interrogation and confession. However, 
researchers need a psychological method that explains the step-by-step -step process and logic through which the social influence techniques of interrogation overcome a suspect's resistance, manipulate his perceptions and reasoning, and ultimately move him from denial, which is in his self-interest, whether he is guilty or innocent, innocent, to admission, which is always against his self-interest. There are a number of psychological models or paradigms that purport to explain the psychology of interro interrogation and the decision to confess. The most widely accepted paradigm of the psychology of interrogation and confession is what Johnson has called the decision-making model of confession. Drawing on more than 50 years of theoretical and empirical research on rational choice approaches to decision-making, both in so social psychology and microeconomics, the decision-making model posits that a suspect's decision-making during interrogation is shaped by one, how the social influence techniques of interrogation cause him to perceive his available causes of action, two, the suspect's subjective perception of the probability of each course of action actually occurring, and three, the utility values or benefits, as well as corresponding harms associated with each course of action. In short, the decision model focuses on how the interrogator's efforts at persuasion influence, influence a suspect's perception and analysis of his immediate situation, the options available to him and the likely consequences of each possible course of action. According to this model, the interrogator's goal is to persuade the suspect that the act of admission is in his self-interest and therefore the most rational course of action, just as the act of continual denial is against his self-interest and therefore the last rational course of action. I think we'll just leave it there. Um, so there's some very interesting stuff in in this article by uh, Richard Leo and Stephen Drizzen, which was cited by Judge Duffin. But um, I need to get ready for and prepare for um, a, um, a video later tonight with uh, Tracy Keogh, which I'm really looking forward to. Um, so we'll catch you again soon. And thanks for tuning in. Bye for now.